Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Institute. I'm uh, very delighted to welcome all of you to this, our eighth uh, Zeb Schiff uh, Memorial Lecture on Middle East security. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite events of the year, and I'm uh, especially delighted that we can host this in our new offices. Um, uh, boy, Zev would have been uh, uh, proud and surprised to see us grow um, as we have grown. Zev was an associate of this organization and was a close friend from the very beginning, back when we were uh, uh, five people in 1,500 square feet, um, which is about the size of the men's room over here. And so, um, uh, uh, boy, he would have been surprised. I can see him, I can hear him in my mind saying, Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very special pleasure that, uh, that uh, Sarah is here, uh, Zev's wife, Hadar, Zev's daughter, um, Ayal, his son, couldn't be here, uh, but we're very happy that you can be here for this very special occasion. Uh, n normally, I open uh, this, uh, this lecture with a remark about, um, which I've said almost every year, about how uh, w one of the things that made Zev so unique um, uh, was that Zev Schiff had a way of marrying being um, uh, a very proud Israeli and even a proud Zionist and being a journalist with enormous integrity and, and, uh, and guts and even a bit of cunning in uh, figuring out uh, um, uh, stories. Um, uh, and that, that mixture, which is not a natural mix when you think about it, being a, uh, a proud um, a nationalist, a proud Israeli, a proud Zionist on the one hand, and being a, uh, a brilliant, objective, independent journalist on the other hand, is not always a natural mix. But Zev somehow figured out how to get that balance right. Um, and it, uh, um, you know, it, it, is, it is not a, a knock on uh, today's journalists to say that, um, that Zev had the magic formula to, uh, um, uh, as I try to follow Israeli journalism, Zev had the magic formula in this regard. Now, it is, it is um, easy to play the game um, of, uh, of, you know, what would Zev have said as he looks at, the, you know, over the last several months, of this great U.S.-Israel divide over the Iran deal, uh, the Iran nuclear agreement. I'm not going to try to imagine what Zev had said. Um, um, all I know is that, on the one hand, Zev was one of the earliest and loudest and um, most insightful um, uh, warning bells of the Iranian nuclear program. Wrote about it um, uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, when it was not on anybody's agenda here in Washington, and would it be would be ringing the bell all the way for the subsequent 20 years. At the same time, uh, Zev um, had uh, um, uh, a deep and thorough appreciation of how important America was to Israel. Um, uh, uh, he would um, uh, he I mean I, I steal a line from him, which is you know Israel's. Israel's deterrence is not the sum of its uh, guns, tanks, and planes. Israel's deterrence is also um, the, the reflection of its most important alliance. And one has to value that and appreciate that so much. Um, Zev would have found the right balance between these two themes. And his reporting and his columns would have reflected that. And uh, however you think um, uh, uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship has emerged over the last um, several months, I am sure that it would have been stronger uh, and more resilient if Zeb's voice was present in the recent debate. Um, someone else's voice is about to become more present um, in Israel's political life, and that's the person who I'm uh, greatly privileged um, has come to uh, be part of this memorial lecture and to deliver the, um, uh, the memorial lecture. And that is um, uh, uh, the 20th Chief of Staff of the Israel Defense Forces, um, Lieutenant General Benny Gantz. Um, Benny is a, uh, a very well-known figure to Washington. Um, uh, uh, not many Chiefs of Staff have served in Washington. Um, uh, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, of course, did. 
uh, and that is not, uh, not an easy act to follow. Um, uh, but um, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, among the many attributes of our, of our lecturer today, and you can find brief bios of both him and Zev in your program, um, Benny Gantz has been a soldier's soldier. Um, someone who uh, came up through the ranks, paratrooper, uh, uh, and then of course commander, general, um, all the high ranks you want, but someone who has always valued uh, the importance um, uh, and the, the, uh, the essential attribute of what it means to be, to be a soldier in Israel's uh, defense force. And you could see that in how he dealt with um, soldiers in the regrettable fighting that occurred on his watch in Gaza and elsewhere, um, and the relationships that he's had um, with soldiers and their families um, throughout his tour of duty. Um, there is no one, I think, that has left service um, with um, uh, uh, an even deeper well of integrity and uh, public acclaim and um, um, uh, 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 public um, uh, gratitude for his service um, in Israel uh, than Benny Gantz. And I am really delighted that, um, uh, that he came from Israel, he just arrived last night, that he came from Israel to deliver this year's Zev Schiff Memorial Lecture. Um, uh, Benny, on behalf of the Washington Institute, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, Rob and uh, Sarah and Adar. It's a pleasure to be here today. You haven't mentioned that I was in the carpool with Leon Weintraub here <laughs> when we were in Washington. Actually, he wrote, you know, he fixed my papers in terms of uh, lectures and literature and uh, grammar, and I didn't let you the handout before, so maybe you, we can still do it, right? Pleasure to be here today. Seriously, it's a very respected uh, institution, and I'm pleased to be here, and I'm very honored to be here speaking on a memorial event for Zev Schiff, uh, which was uh, a real icon for me in Israel. Uh, I was telling Rob before we started that actually when I met Zev and spoke with him, I was not who I am now. I mean, I was still Benny, but I knew less than what I know now. So in so many ways, I in a way really study from him and learn from him, uh, not just you know, uh, having some background briefing or whatever meeting we had. And I've, I really cherished his wisdom, and even more so, uh, or as much as I cherish his wisdom, I cherish his ethics, which we lack so much in today, very shallow activities of so many people around. And I think that we should look into men like Zev and his friends and go back a little bit to more basics and ethics and things that we must maintain. So we, because we can, we can and we should change so many things in our lives as changes arise. But we should never give up our core ethics, core values, core interests, whatever, whatever those are. Uh, so it's really a privilege to be here today. Uh, I thought that the best way to interact would be to answer questions, uh, if I can. And if not, I, so, I see so many people around you that can do it instead of me, so this is not a big issue. However, I do have ten remarks I would like to start with, short remarks, short paragraph, and share my thoughts and we can take it from there any way you would, uh, you would like me to do at the beginning. When I was about to finish my assignment, I had an appearance in front of our foreign committee, foreign and security committee at the parliament, the Israeli Knesset. Five people showed up out of 15, but there was the better five. Among them uh, was Mofaz who was the former chief of staff, and he obviously uh, kind of spoke and, sa and said a few things uh, for me, and said that he really envoyed me because I had only one prime minister and two ministers of defense. So
So I said, you know, Shaul, you are right, but don't forget that you had only one president in Egypt and I had three. <laughs> uh, so if, if I really look at the last five years in the Middle East, I can really sum it up uh, to two words. Balagan is strategy in Hebrew <laughs> and strategic mess in English. And it's a very dynamic situation. We all see it. I don't have to repeat it and, and you know, to explain everything that we all saw. And the voice of the crowds became so important. The voice of the streets became so important. So even if we look at Egypt as we see it now, I don't think it's the same Egypt as Mubarak left it when he went down even though Assisi kind of came back. It's a U-turn, it's not really 360 degree. In between those two points of where Mubarak was and where Assisi is right now, there is the crowd and the streets and their demands. And he understands that he needs to fulfill something for those 90 million people in order to stay in power. And if not, he's going to go down with the next demonstration, this way or another. And in a way, everything, everything is so dynamic, everything is so moving. And, uh, and we see it in our own eyes. I've heard Shimon Peres once saying in, ina in another occasion that it's, to deal with such an issue, it's like fixing a watch while it's working. It doesn't stop. Changes keeps going on, and you still need to fix the watch type of stuff. Uh, so I don't want to go over those issues, obviously. Uh, but I do say this. Well, yes, it's the end of Sykes-Picot, and I think that in certain regions, especially in the area of Iraq, Syria, Kurdistan, and these areas, some of it might be in Libya as well, I hope in other places and less, we'll see a new shape of statehood uh, following what used to be Sykes-Picot lines, and we'll see the, uh, the, the characteristic will be more on a tribal and local agendas than on uh, artificial lines as they, were being, as they have been portrayed years back. Uh, so, well, you know that anyhow. So what I have to suggest as challenges has to do, I think, with uh, three zones. Uh, and since we face such an ambiguity and we don't really know what's going to happen, so we must find what needs to be done. For example, in the case of Israel, what are the defensive manner you're going to have facing f unknown future. We did it in two areas in Israel, I think, fairly well, in the Sinai border and the Golan, and Golan Height border. Those areas, when you look at it operationally speaking, are totally different than they were, let's say, five years back. So we took the measures that need to, needed to be taken, but something that we know that for definitely we must, be, we must have a defend, a, a serious defensive capabilities. The other issue, which is crucial, even more crucial than before, is our inter intel capabilities. Because sometimes it was tough, but it was simple. You have a state in front of you, maybe the fight is tough, but you know what you're doing. Now there are so many players, and uh, Herzi once showed me a slide, maybe I have to give it to his credit. Czechs, players, but five people against each other on the same board. So it's not that two people are playing chess. So many players are playing around it. And the levers of state versus players have changed a lot. So you must have a very high level of intelligence. Uh, so we must continue this as well. Then what are the options? Over there, I would seek to try and increase as much as we can cooperations with others. Because so many interests, and I will go back to it in a few minutes, uh, are there for others as well. So we can have some kind of cooperation that we didn't have maybe uh, before. Last but not least, I think it takes a huge amount of new kind of leadership. Because we must look again in our processes of how we learn things. I don't think that anyone knows what's going to be the future. No one really can promise, I know the solution 
for everything. He doesn't even know the questions. So how can you have the solution? And even the political leadership must understand that in such dynamic situation, strategic learning processes are part of professionals, but also of inst political institutions and political leadership and state leadership, because we have to come up with new strategies while those things are still happening. And maybe we don't know all the answers. So we go back to what we must do and make sure we, or we try to prepare what we might able to do in, in different cases in the future. But it is by far more complex than what we used to have 5, 10, 20 years ago. Okay, those are the political players, those are the states, those are the interests, those are the capabilities. A leads to B, B leads to C, etc. It doesn't work this way anymore. It's a whole new dimension that we need to take in consideration. And it's true for the uh, operational, strategic level, and it's also true for the state level of how you approach uh, things uh, as for today. The second aspect I would come up with is the operational changes. So we have seen it all. When I was 1973 war, I was a 14-year-old kid. I was not in the IDF at the time. In our backyard, between the village I was raised in, my, farm, my, my parents' farm, and the uh, Air Force nearby, there was a Hawk battery defending the Air Force base. And I went and helped them as a 14-year-old kid, you know, bringing stuff, bringing food, and trying to be part of the part of the event. I haven't seen one plane throughout those three weeks. Uh, but when I was the chief at the very same field of my, my parents' backyard, not the scud, grads and Kassam rockets fell coming out of Gaza. So it's a different threat in the very same place. And I ordered, as the chief of staff, to close those Hawk batteries. So in 1973, you know, it was part of my future, and in 19, uh, whatever, two, 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 two and a half years back, we have adapted a new strategy of and technologies and capabilities as far as a defense state of the art. We all must remember it was made together with the United States and the support of the United States administrations. And I think that we are presenting the state of the art uh, defense, air defense capabilities in Israel. I hope we won't need it, but unfortunately we will. So we see the other aspects as well. So it's uh, standoff trajectories, under surface capabilities, more urbanized area. The whole list, you all know it. Let me not repeat it. Uh, maybe I would just say new dimensions. Uh, cyber is definitely one of them. Uh, the IDF has moved a lot into this uh, arena beginning six or seven years ago, and, and we continue to do so. We started at the time of uh, General Ashkenazi. I continue it as a as a chief, and Nangadi is doing a great job on this, and definitely it's in the hands of our very, very talented guys. Uh, so we must promote this uh, as well. So if I have to ask myself what would be the future lessons of this situation in terms of operational changes, I think I would come up with maybe four or five sentences. First, and very unsurprisingly, it takes budgets. And I think that we argue too much about this issue. Israel is not a state that can argue on this. It just needs to put the right amount that it needed. It's not skyrocketing. I don't think it is that much. And put aside this argument. It's ridiculous. We have so many other resources that we can argue and resource allocation. Then I don't think that just the security budget is the solution for all the other needs we have within, within the state of Israel. And we must maintain our capabilities and really our edge over the others. Go back to the United States that we are lately so much angry about it, but we, don't, we should not forget the QME that we have with the, with the United States. And that's the only nation I can, I'm aware of, and definitely I don't know that other, others have any similar legislation that tell the President of the United States to report to the Congress every four years about Israel's qualitative military age. It's 
unheard of type of stuff and need to be appreciated by, by Israel, definitely by me. But we must maintain this qualitative military edge and we must make sure that our forces are, are very, I would say, hybrid. We cannot allow ourselves to have forces that can deal with military stuff and forces that can deal with terrorism stuff and forces that can do this or forces that can do that. It's true that you must maintain also some spe specialities, but altogether, uh, I think we have to be uh, very hybrid, very balanced between Air Force, Ground Force, Cyber, Navy, etc., etc. Very interoperable. We cannot afford not to be one, not to become interoperable, and I think we are doing a great job on this one uh, as well, as well, sorry, and very, very flexible uh, and, and being able to react. Once again, no one can really portray the, scenar the future scenarios. This is, this is gone. The scenarios as we're going to see them are different than what we vision. And when something will start, we will have to adapt ourselves very fast to whatever situation will arise in the future, and only by doing so, training so, practicing, practicing ourselves, um, uh, we, can, we can do that. So all those changes on the operational arena, obviously we're tackling them, and I'm sure that uh, the IDF and the security organizations, not just the IDF, uh, must continue this uh, as much as we can. Well. Iran. Uh, I followed it like all of you did. Uh, very close till last February and from a very distant since February till now. Uh, so short, I would say that yes, I do agree that a better deal could have been reached. Uh, I do see the challenge that the theoretical enrichment rights that the Iranian might have gained out of this is indeed a challenge, especially in, on those areas. But I also see the half full part of the class here. And I see the achievement of keeping away the Iranians for 10, 15 years uh, into the future. Uh, and postponing their capabilities of having a nuclear capability uh, and with the, with the right price. Usually they have said that uh, war is, the, is an extension of the political activities. In other words, you have political activities and then if you cannot succeed, you, you use war. Well, they have had political activities and they have saved the war which I think it's not bad in and of itself. Now, I'm not naive. I understand who we are dealing with. I understand why the Iranians want to possess nuclear capabilities. I understand that we must look into the future, and I think this is what we need to suggest. And to look, I would look at the deal as, as it is. It's a done deal. And let's look forward. And looking forward, I would definitely uh, promote, for most important, the intel capabilities and the intel cooperation between the entire organizations and country to make sure that we expand as much as we can the known areas versus the unknown areas. And if they stay unknown, then they know that you are not unknown. And we all know this sentence. I cannot repeat it, right? But we must extend our intel capabilities. We must continue to build defensive and offensive capabilities that will be used as deterrents or as an operational mean when and if needed in future times. We must strengthen the others around and do everything in our capacity to prevent the need of nuclear race. Currently, I don't see the need for one. From other perspective, not from you know, like what my, the others might think. Because if we can ensure that Iran doesn't get it, 
So why would the Saudis have it? Etc. Etc. Uh, and last but not least, I would even dare to say that there is a need to reach out to the Iranian people themselves, which have a very large base of westernized aspect. They want to live their life. They see the internet just as you and me see it. And let's turn it into a kind of a honey trap, if you wish, for future times. Now, from what I know, and I think I know, and from what I assess, and I think I have a basis to assess it, I'm not worried as far as Israel's security situation. We are the strongest country in the world. We know how to take care of ourselves. And this issue is a worldwide issue that inflects the Babel Mandab and all those seed trails. It infects the region. And then it has to do with us, not the other way around. It's not an Israeli issue, then a regional issue, and then a world challenge. It's the other way around. It's a world challenge. Let the world deal with it. It's a regional challenge. Let's see how the region deals with it. And we will stay strong as we are. So I refuse to get hysteric on this. And I think we need to look into the future. And I understand that the United States of America has suggested it, and I'm sure the, United, the state of Israel uh, will be there. Uh, and we should continue to promote our capabilities uh, to face uh, a negative development if it arises uh, down, the, uh, down the future. Uh, I want to say a few words about the Arab countries around us. Uh, basically, I see them sharing with us the same interest. If I would, I'm sure the Jordanian chief would have said it, I believe, not that I know, that people from Saudi, Emirates, the Egyptian definitely, even Lebanese, would share the same interests as Israel as far as seeing what's happening with the jihadists around them. And uh, I think we should uh, uh, keep supporting those countries, uh, helping them uh, to survive those uh, events that we all see. Uh, I can recommend for the United States or the, and the other world leaders to promote human rights, stability, and only then democracy concept of, of administration. But they, we all should prefer, for the time being at least, human rights, stability, that those might lead eventually into democracy concepts. If we try to bring democracy concepts, it would bring instability before the area is actually ready to deal with it. So you end up having such a huge GMS. And I think we should try. And it's not too late, because we see what's happening in Egypt. We see what's happening in Saudi. We see what's happening in other countries. We need to strengthen Jordan as much as we can. We need to support other places uh, as well. I go back for a second for operational needs and hybrid capabilities. It's true that most of our threats are kind of asymmetric threat as we see them right now, but given the fact that stability is not totally secure, we also must be able to cooperate against military forces, regular or semi-regular military forces as we see them, because stability is not there, and who knows what's going to be the future. And it takes time to build capabilities. So I would remember that uh, as well. ISIS. Uh, It bothers me more on the strategic values of it than it bothers, bothering me on the operational piece of it. Uh, to sell a girl for a back pack of cigarettes takes human values to no, none of it, not existing, as if they not, do not exist at all. And ISIS respect nothing but itself. I doubt if it respects itself, but it definitely respects nothing but itself. So I think the world cannot allow itself to let this phenomena uh, stay there. Yes, it's going to take a long journey. Definitely. Many calculus, I agree. But we cannot accept the phenomena. 
So if you ask me, it should be based on three pillars, fence it, fight it, and shape it. Fence, make sure that all the countries around it are strong enough to contain it in the region where it's at, and that it's not explored as much as we can. And if it shows up in other places, like in Sinai, like in Africa, maybe we must fight it there, uh, obviously, as well. Uh, fight it, whether it's defensive, whether it's offensive standoff for special forces, I think down the road, after some calculus and maybe some more time, ground forces activities will have to be there. I don't see it is disappearing. So I don't think we'll be able to, the world won't be able to, to, to give up on this. So it's, it, takes, it will take a coalition to do it. It will take a while to build it, but I hope it will happen and shape it in supporting what, whoever's there, the people there, and others. But there is another point that I've heard from a very, uh, from an author, we had a private discussion, that once told me, you know, Vanny, you can, you can win something, you can fight something with military forces, but you can win an idea only with an alternative idea. And I think this is so much true. So at the same time as we fight it, I think we must think and try to look for a I positive idea, I would say, that can be used and promote. So even people, f Muslims from places like Europe and other places, when they want to identify themselves, they might identify themselves with some positive alternative idea and not just by the jihadist idea as they see it now, which is bigger than what they are. <coughs> Maybe Tunisia, secular government, was just elected after the Arab Spring has began. Maybe this is a place where you can support. Maybe you can support places like Egypt. Maybe you can support those places as the more positive ideas that Muslims can identify themselves with and not just the vectors of, of jihadists as we see it now. Uh, Syria, uh, you know, I will not take the risk saying two, three weeks, that type of stuff. <laughs> uh, what we might see currently, especially with the Russian support, is the establishment of an Alawite or smaller Syria enclave in the northern western part of Syria. Uh, there is a, a link-up of interest between the Alawite, the Syrians, Hezbollah, Iran, and definitely Syria, who needs Tartus, Latakia places as a place to operate in the Mediterranean from. Uh, the challenge would be that it might be kind of what we used to call the radical axis of Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and the support of the Russians. I see the downsides of it. The upside of it would be maybe we can stabilize and buffer a little bit the expansion of those jihadists into the western part of Syria and into Lebanon as well, uh, which is fragile anyhow. Uh, so there is upside, there are, there are downsides. Maybe we see here some kind of Soviet mandate, if you wish, uh, over Syria, but it has to come up with an understanding of how everybody continues to fight um, the jihadists. Now, as we spoke a little bit before, uh, Rob and myself, why are the Russians are doing it? Uh, are they speaking with the Americans over Ukraine, but in Syria? Are they speaking with the jihadists? Don't move on to the southern part of Russia as we're doing it here. Are they just wanting it for Assad to stay, or they wanting to secure it for someone else other than Assad to walk in? So many things that might be an explanation. I leave it open, or I would say all of the above type of stuff, but that's the reality. On the ground, there is a challenge of deconfliction, and I don't know what happened in the meetings between uh, Israel and Russia uh, a week ago or so, uh, but we must make sure that we are capable of operating when and if needed in this uh, area. Another yeah. hot potato is Israeli and Palestinian relations. Uh, 
I would simply say this. Uh, no one is going anywhere. And therefore, uh, everybody uh, should stick to what's important and give up all the other dreams. Uh, we need to stick to security and uh, kind of uh, giving up the dreams as we would like to have. And all governments of Israel have said two-state solutions, so this is not, this is not a news. Uh, and the same goes for the Palestinians. If they want to gain sovereignty, they need to give up some of their dreams uh, as well. And I think we need to stick to security. I won't get into details. Uh, it has been dealt with before, and I think uh, uh, we, we must uh, promote it, not because, of, and from Israeli perspective, I'm saying it because of Israeli interests. Uh, all governments of Israel have said that, uh, <coughs> so I think that that's the way ahead, and it should be, should be dealt, should be done. Uh, Israel image in the world. Uh, this is tough. Uh, BDS and all those activities that we see and we must find ways to promote those capabilities because after all we are not as bad as people say we are. We have been treating Syrians for four years now. Way before Europe even started to think about it. I approved personally each and every one of them that came to Israel for treatment. Hundreds of them were treated already. We are a small country. Um, where, we, we, where will be the best place, really, to be a secure Arab in the Middle East right now? Israel. Where is the second best place? West Bank. See what's happening in other places. See what's happening in Lebanon, see what's happening in Syria, see what's happening in Libya, see what's happening in other places. Where would be the most secure place to live? Uh, hospital, education, and everything. And, other than, and of course, all our capabilities, medical capabilities, agriculture, scientific, well, name it. You all know, you know Israel very well. And I think we must find ways of explaining it. Uh, in different ways, and not by governments, but by people to people. And I think that the new media capabilities are very much in there, and I think we can use it much, by far more than we have used it so far. Uh, and I think that we must, uh, must not give up on this uh, uh, specific. Uh, Israel and U.S. relations. Uh, I was once asked to uh, come and speak in front of the Marine uh, Anniversary Day in Tel Aviv. Uh, and I sum up my, uh, my speech then saying there's no other Israel for the United States in the Middle East and there's no other U.S. for Israel in the world as well. And I basically believe that's the situation. Israel is a solid rock of stability, of democracy, of so many different capabilities that you all know very well. There's nothing else except us at that level. So it's not that there are no other countries which are very important and precious, etc., etc. But we do represent something uh, which is kind of U.S. extension, if you wish, into the Middle East as a forward post, if you wish. And the United States was there, uh, I, I guess, I don't know, 11 seconds or 11 minutes after the declaration in '48. Uh, 47, and, 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 and from, there, uh, from there ever. And we must not forget it. A friend of mine, uh, General Dempsey, wrote me the other day uh, on a present that he gave me, uh, partners by duty, friends by choice. And this is exactly how I feel about the United States. Partners by duty, instrumentally, strategically speaking, blah, 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 friends by choice, values, and people to people. And we must continue this, and we must promote it as much as we can, uh, as I think it is so important to both our futures, understand the differences you know, between Israel and the States, obviously. It's, uh, uh, you know, um, when I first met Martin Dempsey, uh, 
someone sent me a link before I met him showing him singing New York, New York of Frank Sinatra. By the way, I think he sings better than Frank Sinatra. <laughs> but when he came to Israel, I took him to a restaurant and I brought a few soldiers to sing something and you know, we all know Pollard and everything, so I told him, listen, Martin, you know we don't gather intelligence on the states, but it doesn't mean we, don't, we know nothing and I have those soldiers speak, singing for him, New York, New York. And I was very pleased, he was very excited, and I was so happy that I tricked him. So I pay back visit to the States, and we sit in his home, and we have dinner with a few guests. And then 12 opera singers walk in, <laughs> walk in and singing uh, Jerusalem of Gold in Hebrew. <laughs> so he wanted to show me, OK, you with your tricks, but we are a superpower. You know? <laughs> don't, don't, don't mess with me. By the way, and I like this idea because even in, in Haiti, when we were there, we were the first one to come in with the help of the Americans, and we did great for two weeks. We really saved so many lives, but we ran out of breath. You know, it was too far for us, too big for us. And then I think it's called the Comfort. It's a huge hospital ship of the United States, probably 10,000 beds, everything in it. And so we have transferred all our patients to that ship. So basically, I had this idea. We start something, and then the American come and fix it. So that was my strategy for Iran. I said, let us start something. You will fix it later. <laughs> they didn't buy the idea. Uh, U.S.-Israel relations are cherished for both sides, I believe. Uh, I'm sure that all obstacles which might be there for several reasons must be bypassed. And we must look into the future. I think we can look to the, to the future. We have no alternative but to look into future cooperation as well. Last, not least, I would say the most important one. I believe that the biggest and the most serious challenge or issue for Israel's future strength is inside Israel itself. It's inside the Israeli society itself. The gaps between them, the fraction between it, its segments, and this is something that needs to be taken care of. Every time when I speak about it, I call for uni unity and not for uniformity. Those are two different phrases as far as I understand the English. Jewish tradition had developed over the years, not by agreeing with someone, but by disagreeing with someone. When you sit and learn the Talmud, you disagree with something. You argue over an issue, and this is how you basically flourish. You, you expand your know-how, etc., etc. We talk about synagogue as a joke. You know, you have three synagogues: one you go, one you don't go, the one that you never go. So all those kind of things that are truly there have made Israel and made the Jewish people in Israel a very flourishing and advancing society. It doesn't mean that this is not a weakness. This is a point of strength as long as you know how to keep it in a unified framework of a state and nation uh, with its Jewish nation, uh, citizens and non-Jewish citizens as well. So I think this is a huge uh, challenge that uh, uh, the government of Israel needs to, to deal with and the society in Israel needs to deal with it, and I think it is important. So if I have to sum up what I've said so far, it's very interesting, too interesting, I would say. Uh, but that's, that's, that, it, that it is what it is. Uh, I think we will face a long period until it will re-stabilize itself. I don't know, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years. It's not going to end up tomorrow. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, from Israeli perspective, it's relatively quiet, but fragile, you know, in all fronts. But I don't go, you know, like on a day-to-day -day basis assessment, but it's very fragile. We have to behave and to act sometimes with force, sometimes with not using force. Uh, and we have to be very responsible of how we act there. I have confidence in the future of Israel. Uh, I've seen and had the right to be part of the IDF that really represents the Israeli society in so many ways and see how many people walk in, how they do with each, with each other, how they interact with each other, uh, and uh, I'm definitely confident with the security of Israel. And I see 
and currently I see more and more of it. I'm also confident with the economy of Israel, with the scientists in Israel, with the other realm of activities as I, as I get to see them even more so uh, to, do the, to those days as well. So if I have to think what would they have, would have said about the situation, I risk to say that he would suggest to calm down, to get in the room, to, to talk about what's really important for both sides, whether it's America and the United States, what's important inside the Israeli society, stick to our core values and our core interests, adjust all the rest that need to be adjusted. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, um, Benny, General Gantz. Uh, that was really quite a, quite a tour d'horizon, 10 important topics that you hit um, in just uh, brief remarks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity of uh, uh, opening a discussion and posing a few questions and then turn the floor over to, uh, to, to our guests. Um, uh, I do want to ask you about a topic that uh, didn't hit your top 10. Um, and that is uh, the arena where Israel was engaged in fighting over the last number of years, and that is Gaza. Um, uh, uh, Israel was, um, uh, you know, has found itself fighting in Gaza uh, three times in recent years. Uh, they're coming more frequently. The battles are getting longer. Um, uh, uh, there's no certainty that we've seen the last. So let me ask your assessment. Um, uh, what is the state of deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Gaza? Uh, do you expect there to be another round? And what else can Israel or other parties do to prevent another round and begin to address whatever the more underlying problems vis-a-vis -vis Gaza? Well, Gaza is definitely a challenge for us, uh, both on the strategic level and on the operational level as well. The strategic level or strategic aspect of it consists of almost two million people who live there and being run by the Hamas and, and have the right to live normal life. Uh, babies that were born on both sides of the, 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 the fence last night are standing and it should be, will be raised up differently. But they are the same human beings as we know them. Uh, and the operational piece of it is obviously Hamas branch, other organizations there, uh, and the tactical aspect of standoff trajectories and undersurface capabilities, urban warfare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I think that. Uh, the IDF has, has, has and will always have the capability to overtake Gaza and regain operational advantage over this area. And then the state of Israel will pay the strategic price for what we will do. For instance, we can hold the Australian people under our hands. So, between choosing the strategic price of taking over, of holding Gaza for so many years into the future, or rounds of conflict as we saw them, I think that uh, so far we have done right. It doesn't mean that in future times we will not have to act with a broader perspective with every people, which I'm specifically speaking. Now, I think that lots of effort have been done in Gaza Strip before Protective Edge and after Protective Edge as well to promote human aspects, humanitarian aspects, building, food, floods, commerce, uh, so many things that, you know, hundreds of trucks goes in on a daily basis, hundreds of trucks. I'm not sure it's probably, it's probably around 500 or maybe even more now. Uh, there is a gap between the, I guess there is a gap between the military branch and the political branch of Hamas uh, itself, it's kind of itself. 
But that brings me to the chances of escalation again. I think the chances are there. Um, and it's not that I see the interest of any one of them to start it, but I'm not saying it will not evolve, I would say. So from Israel's perspective, I think we should try and promote the situation in Gaza as much as we can. Uh, we need to um, and we need to maintain our readiness to uh, future conflicts as they might rise uh, in future times as well. Don't, don't hear me? It's in and out. Yeah. Just try and get you boosted yeah. a little bit. Every time I don't know what to say, I just push a button here and <laughs> it's close. Thank you. Um, all right, let, let, let me go up the strategic ladder uh, and jump to the other end. Um, uh, you made some very important remarks about the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, uh, done deal, we need to look forward. Uh, now, Israel, of course, is not part of the Iran nuclear agreement. Um, uh, its major ally is, not just is, but its major ally is the principal promoter of the Iran nuclear agreement. Um, up until now, uh, Israel and the United States have been a close partner in all sorts of Iranian uh, uh, issues, intel, um, operations, all sorts of things. How do you see the U.S.-Israel partnership vis-a-vis -vis Iran moving forward? Uh, how do you expect to deal with limitations and constraints? What sorts of new opportunities might there be for Israel to operate, for Israel and the United States to, to work together? You know, it's... Uh, it's very, very difficult to really refer to these issues because on most things you cannot even talk. Uh, Israel is a sovereign country. If it ends up understanding that it needs to operate, then I guess it will operate. I would try and maintain the strategic, the strategic relations and what follows it in a very tight connection with the states as much as possible. Uh, so, of course, we do a lot of things together. Uh, and I think we can share and we should continue to share and I'm sure that we are doing it. So, basically, I think we need to work on it together. And Israel has the right to decide whether it wants to act, if it wants to act in any given time. <coughs> but I think we have a lot to offer to the states, and I think the states have a lot to offer to us. And I think that we should, we should follow this line of action. Now, it is very complicated, Rob, to talk about it, because uh, I obviously will not get into the details I knew till six months ago, and I don't know the details of today, so I'm kind of limited here. Uh, but if generally speaking, I do believe we share identical interest on this issue. And if that's correct, then all the rest is solvable. Um, on the other side of your northern border, up until now, you've had to deal, of course, with Hezbollah and missiles and Regrettably, Israel has fought, has, fought, uh, has fought there. But now you have Russian troops, you have Iranian troops um, uh, on the other side of the, uh, the Syrian border. This is a totally new dynamic for Israel, to have uh, um, a foreign state deployment on your border. Um, how do you deal with this? How do you address this? It's, it's, it's different than just dealing with the Syrians or just dealing with sub-state actors, but Russians and Iranians? Yeah. So first of all, I'm glad that I'm, I'm not into the details of what was the, in the trip to, the, to, to Moscow the other, the other day, but it's very important to, to maintain open channels with whoever you can maintain open channels, channels with. And if we don't have direct channels to those people, uh, to some of the players, we must look for bypassing and find indirect channels to those people. So strategic communication, I would say, is so important in those days. 
And secondly, uh, I would say again, um, something that I've said during my briefing here, the Intel capabilities are so crucial uh, because if before we just had to find a needle in the hay, in a hay pile, now there are several of them and you don't want to touch all of them. So, and, and, and you still don't want to light up the entire hay pile in the area. So Intel goes back to the, to the game as much as you can. Uh, I guess we will have to be able to act directly against each and every threat that we think we need to act against. And once again, uh, I would, I believe that if we, if we see something which is really, really threatening us, militarily speaking now, and we find no alternative, then we need to act. Uh, and I think we will, we have done it before, and I'm sure we're doing it, and we'll do it in the future as well. So yes, it is by far more complex. That's and, and as I said, it makes it more. It unfortunately it makes it more interesting. <laughs> uh, you mentioned briefly, uh, and then you dismissed the controversy over budgets and money. Um, well, let me ask the question this way: If you had the marginal dollar, where would you spend it in terms of Israel's national security? Uh, to try to simplify it, if you would have only one dollar, I would put it on Intel. If you would give me two, I would put it on offensive capability. If you give me three, I will invest in, in defense as well. But if you had only one, I think Intel would be the most important one because then, then you know how to allocate all of your other operational or strategic resources. But if you don't have the, the, the right intel, uh, you'll end up uh, wasting lots of uh, security energy in no place. Okay. Uh, look, let, let me ask one last question, and it goes to your, your tenth point. Um, your tenth point being that uh, the most serious security challenge to Israel comes from within. Uh, and I'm not going to try to, to pull out of you um, you know, your own political aspirations. I'll let other people ask that question. Um, uh, if you could make one practical suggestion on this front, though, what would it be? What, what would you want, you know, you have your, your, your five minutes on Israel National TV and on what, what we should do to improve our internal situation, <laughs> practically, operationally, what would it be? It's not that much practically, but it's more philosophically. But let me, let me use the liberty of answering anything I want, right? I would suggest to all fragments of the Israeli society to ask themselves not what is it that we are about to gain, but what is it that we are willing to give up? Because only by willing to give up something, you leave space to the other one to approach. And if everybody give up something, we will be able to get closer to each other. So if, if you ask me, that would be my philosophy. Uh, so, you know, when you bring it into practical perspective, so, you know, the ultra orthodox says, okay, for us this is important, but we are willing to do this and this and this. So people need to give up something, otherwise no one can get closer to each other. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to open the floor to your questions. Um, I'll begin with uh, my colleague David Makovsky and come over then to your English grammar professor, Leon. Uh, David up in front. So, in keeping with your last remark, Benny, can you, can you, uh, I don't know if you've said anything in public about something that now might seem like ancient history, uh, but the Allen plan. Uh, I wonder if you can make any remarks about it. Can Israel agree to the idea of foreign forces on the Jordan Valley as part of any deal with the Palestinians, point one? And the other point is you express the confidence of the U.S. and Israel working together, saying there's identical interests on Iran. There's been a lot of debate in this country. As you correctly say, it's a done deal now. So we could look back over the summer. 
How confident are you that the United States and Israel could deal with a cash infusion of Iran to Hezbollah and other allies of, of the Iranians, other proxy forces? How concerned are you about the IDF? And, you know, do you think the U.S. and Israel can handle this threat of, of, of Iranian cash infusion to the region? Uh. I think that we can. I think we should. Uh, this is why international cooperation is so important. It's not just Israel and the United States. It's, it's the international community that needs to understand that Iran acts in so many different places and it needs to tackle those capabilities. So it's not just a local issue. Uh, uh, so altogether, I think that yes, risk might be there, but I think it's uh, we can operate and, and cooperate worldwide against those uh, those aspects. Uh, as far as security considerations, uh, if I make them, if I want to give you a simple answer, then no, I don't think we can have international forces in the Jordan Valley. I think we should secure the borders. I don't expect no one to get killed for me. Uh, and I think that uh, the Jordan Valley, security-wise, don't take it to other places, uh, is as important as it was before, or even more important if you see the last five, six years development. Uh, so basically, that's what I believe. Uh, Leon up in front here. Leon, spare me, eh? Merci. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on what you just mentioned about the Prime Minister's recent trip to Moscow. I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you think, now that you're out of active duty, what do you think are the points he should have stressed to President Putin about Israel's vital interests in that area? And what, if any, are the few points he might have said to the <laughs> Russian president this is our bottom line. This must be respected to the degree that Israel is capable of putting such a demand like that on a power like Russia. Yeah. Well, thank you, Leon. I, th I think that really, I mean, I, I'm not into the details of what have been said there. And, but I assume that, uh, at least from reading just the headlines, and uh, I'll ask the forgiveness of my uh, journalist colleagues here that I read only the headlines which the editors gave them. Uh, I would risk to say that they talked about uh, things that might be given to the Syrians, but basically will be transferred to Hezbollah and from Syria to Lebanon, as we have seen it in the last few years so many different times. And we didn't leave this question open, but we acted against those actions when and if needed. And I think that it had I, I guess that, or I would assume that he clarified those things uh, to the Russians as much as they can. And besides, then it goes back to John Allen's activities and others. It's a, sm it's, a, it's, a, it's a small area, so, you know, everybody's flying there, and there must be some kind of processes of deconfliction and making sure that we have the right ties and the right connections, and I hope that they talked about those issues as well. Uh, so, go back to your question, and to sum it up, I would say I'm not sure that we are that much of strategic engineers in the area and that we can really influence <coughs> so many things. But we have to make sure that what's important for us is well understood, and I think that the Prime Minister have delivered this message. I hope he did. I believe he did. In front here, Gil, and then Mark. Yes. General Gantz, uh, you spoke about the Iranian deal, and I would like to ask you about uh, what is your take on the way that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu handled and continued to handle uh, the dispute uh, with President uh, Obama do you think that his strategy is helpful for Israel's interest, or is it counterproductive? And the other point, uh, just because Rob uh, mentioned it, 
Uh, you spoke about leadership. Do you see yourself at any point in the future taking part in Israel uh, political arena? I'm not in the position to advise the Prime Minister what to do. Uh, I believe that uh, he has his considerations and calculus and experience and overall responsibility to decide how he acts. So he doesn't really need my advice. Uh, I do believe that our relations, meaning Israel and the States, are so important for both sides, and I believe that both leaders understand it and hopefully will continue to operate this way. As for myself, uh, those things currently are not in the horizon. Um, Mark Kimmett, behind. General, good to see you back. Yeah. Thank you, Mo. Uh, I want to go back to the comments that have been made thus far about Syria. That's fine. Go speak right into it. It's fine. Yeah. It was on. I thought I heard you say that you predict that in the long run, it's more likely that we're looking at a rump Syria around Latakia, Latakia and Tar uh, Tarsus, and that most of, by implication, most of Syria is going to become an ungoverned state. Uh, what does that mean for Israel's uh, strategic posture in that part? Is that going to place an additional burden on the Golan and the forces you have to put up there? Is that going to require more resources? How do you handle a Nusra state <laughs> on that flank the way you've handled southern Lebanon? Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's great to see you again. Uh, I think I need to connect the things that I've said about Syria and the things that I've said about ISIS, because when I talked about ISIS, I said, you know, I said, fence it, fight it, and shape it. So the future of those areas need to be shaped. So they, if you ask me, visioning those, visioning it 20, maybe 30 years forward, those ungoverned areas currently being controlled by ISIS will be controlled in a different way, which I cannot define yet whether it's small provinces, confederation, what will be the future, the political future of these, those areas down the road, I cannot, I cannot predict it right now. Uh, operationally speaking, we must be able to operate against whoever we believe we need to operate, specific on kind of almost, I would risk to say almost case by case, but I guess it's not that dramatic, but and it goes back to these intel issues that I was talking about. Because if you don't know who, who is doing what, then you're just using your hammers and with, 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 with no logic. Uh, as far as the Golan Heights, uh, we had a wake-up call in uh, May 15, 2011. There was a demonstration by Palestinians in the northern parts of the Golan Heights they breached an old fence that was there and penetrated into the northern parts of the Golan Heights. We contained it, pushed them back. I still we missed two uh, out of those 150 or 200 that penetrated. But we have changed the entire operational concept at the very same day. And with the next two or three years after that, we have built the whole concept in the Golan Heights. So yes, we will be challenged there. But we are a way ahead of the challenge. And I hope we can keep it this way. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, we, uh, that I asked you about uh, your southern neighbor, um, who hasn't come up in this discussion, which is Egypt. Um, uh, uh, both about the, the uh, you did reference the fact that uh, you had three Egyptian presidents on your watch. But now you have, you have one, one very powerful one. Um, uh, could you give us a, a couple of words about um, uh, Israeli-Egyptian military cooperation today? And in your view, how important is the continued deployment of the MFO uh, to your security? Uh, I think... Uh, uh, as, as Mark asked about the Golan Heights, uh, we have seen uh, similar events in the Sinai border 
uh, different terrorist activities along the border, uh, mainly in the year of 2011, and we changed the concept over there, and there is a whole different operational capability over there. And I'm very satisfied with it right now. Uh, I don't think I would use the phrase cooperation with the Egyptian forces, but more, I would say, of a coordination which is somewhat less, not as high as cooperation. Uh, we share the same border. We must de-conflict each other. Uh, sometimes we see things that we need to talk with the other side and vice versa. And I think the role of the MFO uh, has changed a bit from overseeing the agreement we has that was the Egyptian uh, of actually reflecting to what's happening right now in Sana, which is very important as well. Uh, so the MFO does fulfill an add-on mission, I would say, not just the original mission, which they're still doing, but he can reflect to the world of what's happening there, so I think it's important. Uh, but it's an addition to what it had to do before. Uh, by and large, I think that Egypt... Uh, is a nation state strong and very important not because it represents a magnificent heritage and history but also because it is it has a strategic posture for future times as well on the linkage between Africa and Middle East and Asia obviously Israel Suez Canal now they are talking and maybe even started uh, maybe even started to build another lane on the Suez Canal. Uh, so it's important that Egypt will be strong, stable, and I hope more developed because so many people over there. <coughs> so this is also important and I think we can help them. Okay, very good. Uh, yes, on the far left. <coughs> You okay, sir? Thank you for this fabulous presentation. Um, my question deals with the security uh, impact of the settlements, particularly those farther out in the West Bank. Are there different answers to this question? Do you believe that the settlements in those areas uh, are helpful or harmful to Israel's security, and, and if so, why? All the issue of the uh, settlements is a it's not only it's it's also a political as issue as well uh, some of them I can see exactly what are their security contribution to the state of Israel some of them are a political dispute which I'm not going to get into uh, so in, an, in other words you can see them both some of them just political aspect need to be discussed and some of them have major security Importance. Yes, right in the middle, please. I'm Dick McCormick from CSIS. Um, there was an interesting report in the Economist magazine uh, a couple of weeks ago that Soleimani had had his wings clipped. Um, I, did you see that report? And, and uh, it suggested that Sistani had contacted the Supreme Leader and said he had caused problems among the Sunni community in, in, in Iraq. Uh, and, and they clipped his wings. I just wondered if you had a thought on that subject. Suleimani is running all over the place, uh, but I haven't seen the specific article. Uh, I know that he has some challenges inside Iran, but he's still very much involved in other places, and uh, I think he should be watched carefully. <laughs> yeah, in the back. General, here's something a little bit more operational. Thank when you. you were chief of the general staff, you introduced a doctrine called the war between the wars or the campaign between the wars. And General Eisenkot underlined the importance of that in the strategy document that he released. Why did you feel it necessary to call this a doctrine? And what did you achieve by doing that as opposed to just Israel, a policy that Israel will take action whenever it needs to? At the time, we thought that uh, we should try and find not just 
operational lane, but more of strategic trend, I would say, of what is it that we are trying to achieve. If we want to try and prevent a little bit the, let's say, force buildup of our enemies, so what is it that we are dealing, what is it that we are not dealing? So it gave it some more of strategic trend and just operational lanes, I would say, and it helped to create a common understanding within the IDF and between the IDF and the political echelon of how to operate it, whether it's interoperability within the IDF and also uh, across echelons of military uh, activities and political decisions that uh, need to be taken. So we found it uh, comfortable for us, and it has a sexy name, you know, you have to come up with something, so you come up with this. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you. If I may go back to the neighbors, and I have two questions. The first about Jordan. Uh, from your answer to David's question and from what I heard, there seems to be a concern in Israel that Jordan might be uh, facing instability in the future. Can you speak to that? And also, given the uh, you know, periodic uh, diplomatic tensions between Jordan and Israel, what can you do to deepen the security relation between the two countries? The second question, if I may, goes to the West Bank. And under you and under your predecessor, the security cooperation between the IDF and the Palestinian security forces has gone to a really excellent level. Can you assess the current status of this cooperation, its sustainability, and what can be done to actually deepen it and to sustain it? Thank you. Uh, I, I think that Jordan is a very important friend, ally, and a neighboring country in peace with Israel. Uh, we should do anything in our capacity to support it. We have great, I think, relations with, with the kingdom, with the king, with all his people. Uh, I know they are being challenged. Uh, millions of refugees that already in Jordan have their impact on the society inside Jordan. Some segments in Man area and other places are challenging the kingdom from inside. Now, they are by far more expert about what needs to be done in Jordan than I am. They understand their society, their trends, their levers, what they can do, what they cannot do. And basically, I think that the world and Israel, for its capacity, need to help Jordan as much as, as it can. Uh, it is important not just for Jordan security, it's important for the entire area. Uh, and I think we need to promote it as much as we can. Um, as far as the Palestinian, once again, I don't see cooperation as much as I see coordination. And no one works for anyone there. Uh, and so far, the security level from terrorist activities, not just you know, like stones or Molotov bottles and things like that, but more on the on the heavy piece of, of terrorism is being prevented also because the Palestinians care about it, but mostly because we have our capabilities and we keep our operational flexibility. And when we see that nothing is being done on the other side, then we go ahead and, do, and act against. This is why we succeeded to keep it in, in a stable situation. I think it's very important for the Palestinian to understand uh, that with sovereignty comes responsibility. And if you want Israelis to believe that they can move forward, you must practice it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's good for you and it's good for your future as well. And I hope they will continue it. Benny, I want to thank you very much. I think the, um, uh, one of the most important comments you made in your remarks to do with the fact that Israel today has answers for all its security challenges, that you're confident that you are, uh, that you've left your office in good hands, and that, uh, uh, that while the region around it, around Israel, is turbulent and uncertain and chaotic, that you believe that things for your country are at least today on a good footing. And that, uh, that's actually a powerful statement. Yeah. Uh, 
I said it, and I, and I, and I want to repeat and, and emphasize something. This is by no means Switzerland. <laughs> and we have so many challenges that we need to face. We may fail here and there, and we may pain, feel pains here and there. And when things happen, this is not high tech, this is not engineering, this is the ambiguity of war, it's painful for both sides. So I'm not promising, and I don't think anyone can promise, you know, everyday siesta. It takes hard work for, um, from everybody, but it also calls for confidence. And I know the Israeli society, I've seen it through my troops, I've seen, I'm seeing it now to a degree I gain every day. This is, you know, uh, I do have a very unique experience of get, gaining new perspective than what I've had by looking at so many different things from different perspective now. And I see the nice things about Israel as well, alongside with the difficulties that I've talked about. Uh, but uh, as others have said before, uh, in between pessimists and optimists, I would stay realist, leaning to, to optimist side. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Before, actually, but before we break, I, um, because Benny is here, this is a great opportunity. I do want to introduce our newest IDF fellow, uh, Brigadier General Moni Katz. Moni, if you could stand up. Uh, I'm delighted at the Institute that we have a relationship with the IDF that brings senior officers like Moni here. Welcome. And uh, let me just thank again uh, Sarah and Hadar. It's a privilege to be able to host the Zev Shift Lecture every year. And I'm delighted that this year we have Benny Gantz to deliver it. Thank you. Thank you.